Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dearest respected viewers and welcome to Live in London Our previous discussion was one on how Muharram does not end on the 10 nights and the death of Abu Abdullah but it continues upon the tragedies and atrocities that fell upon Ali Muhammad We discussed a journey from Karbala to Syria with stopovers in Kufa, Mosul, Sinja and Halab Let us continue the story and what happened to the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with Sayyid Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Sayyidna, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you on this evening? Very well, thank you. Very well. So in the previous discussion, we got up to Halib and uh, the Christian priest joining on to the camp and walking towards Syria. In your opinion, coming into Sham, was this the hardest part of, of the tragedies and the atrocities? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No doubt, if you are looking at the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi there is a mention of Asham, Asham, Asham from the lips of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi yes. No one can deny that what took place at Karbala to the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. After Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had died, that was something horrific, that night of the 11th of Muharram, without a doubt, is one of the most horrific nights in the history of the religion of Islam. And Kufa was troublesome, and we showed how certain stops on the journey towards Sham yes. were troublesome. But definitely, when Imam Zain al Abidin is asked years after the event had taken place, and years after they had seen all these tragedies, what was the most difficult for you? He mentions a Sham. Sure. And I think, without a doubt, while other places did show hate towards the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Sham had carried this hate for a while. You know, it wasn't that this hate had just suddenly come overnight. Okay. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan had been the person who was the governor of Sham, which in those days was not what we see as Sham today. If today someone says to you, the time going on Ziyarah to Sham, it means they're going towards Syria. In those yes. days, Sham or Bilad Sham was Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and wow. Jordan. Oof. So Muawiyah had ruled this particular part of the world and the Umayyads had ruled it for over four decades. In other words, the Umayyad propaganda was extremely strong. The anti alid sentiment mm -hmm. was extremely strong. One could see, for example, that when you look within the Sahah, such as Bukhari and Muslim, you have narrations where the Umayyads show their clear hate of Ali. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan's famous question to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, when he asks him, why don't you curse Ali, son of Abu Talib? What is it that prevents you from cursing Ali? And Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas gives a list of the virtues of Imam Ali alayhi salam, mm -hmm. including the fact that Ali was to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family as Harun was to Musa. Musa. That's it. Including, for example, the fact that on the day of Khaybar, he received the banner which everyone wanted. Yes. And also including the fact that on the day of Mubahala, he was known as the nafs of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. But when Muawiyah is asking this, when Muawiyah is saying, why don't you curse Ali? Mm -hmm. It goes to show you that already in Syria, in Palestine, in Jordan, in these areas where the Umayyads had a firm stranglehold, already there was a severe hatred to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Now, some of these people also had hated Imam Ali salam because of his exploits at war. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them may have had relatives who died at Khanda, yeah. relatives who died at Khaybar. And so there was already that hatred that was there. If you look later on, this hatred escalates, by the way, in that land. A sham is a piece of land or, you know, an area of land where the Muslims there despised Ali for a very long time. There is the tradition where Sahel bin Sa'ad mentions how one of the offspring of Marwan talks about the line of Abu Turab mm -hmm. and the Shatm of Abu Turab. This is 
you can find the hadith uh, within Sahih Muslim where he asks him first and, and the hadith is there he, uh, he orders him to curse Ali when Sahel then turns around and says that I'm not going to do that he then says to him okay then at least say Allah at least say that may God withdraw his mercy from Abu Turab. Mm -hmm. You find therefore that this hatred to Ali escalates to such a level where now the children of the man mm -hmm. and the grandchildren of the man are about to enter Sham. Yes. The media was so powerful. And you found that when they're about to enter Sham, Sayyidah Zainab knows the anti-Imam Ali campaign, anti-Imam mm -hmm. Ali movement there. Yes. She knows there's a lot of people who can't stand mm -hmm. her father. And therefore, when someone asks why Imam Zainal Abidin says, Asham, 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 because you've got a lot of people who literally are baying for the blood of the children of Ali. Wow. Wow. Yep. Just a quick um, note to all the viewers is that if you have any questions throughout the show, please don't hesitate to contact us on 0203 515 0199. Dr. Sayyid Amar, one would ask that did uh, the Prophet's family, did the, the daughters of Ali Muhammad, were they aware of what was going to happen? Were they, as in the, the, the details, one could argue they knew that, okay, they're not really going to like us. There's a really big, uh, you know, campaign going on against us. But were they prepared for the onslaught and, and the, the verbal abuse and, and so forth? I think there's a conversation between Um Kulthum and Shimr bin Dil Joshan, which highlights that they knew this was going to be something extremely difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Some mention that it could have been Zainab with Shimmer on Kulthum with Shimmer. They're about to enter Sham on the first of Safar. And when they're about to enter Sham, they say to Shimmer that, can you do something for us? The first thing is the thing that they had asked from before, and that is don't place the heads of our beloved ones on mm -hmm. the spears in front of us. You know, purposely they wanted to hurt them. Yes. So they would place the heads of their beloved on the spears, the head of mm -hmm. Abbas on one spear, the head of, for example, Qasim on another, the head of Akbar on another, the head of Imam al-Hussein on another. This was an Umayyad ploy to instill fear into the society. Mm -hmm. It had begun with the likes of Amr bin Hamak al-Khuzai. They wanted to mm -hmm. instill fear into people by putting heads on spears. Today when you see YouTube videos yeah. where it's normal for people to play football with heads in Come Syria Allah. or in terrible, Iraq, terrible. ISIS and their filth. Horrible. You find that many Sunni and Shia look at that with disgust. Mm -hmm. That is not part of the teachings of the religion of Islam, but it's definitely an Umayyad origin to pick up a head. And dare I say, even before Umayyads came into power, mm -hmm. there were a couple of personalities who didn't mind cooking food on a head wow. that was beheaded. But we don't want to uh, go into that yeah. and cause any friction or any no sectarianism problem. as Understood. some will always throw the line against us. So when you're looking at that, that's one thing. But another thing is that Um Kulthum asks Shimmer, can we enter from different gates? Mm -hmm. You see, when you're entering, for example, a city, everyone's eyes are going to be on you. So she asks, yeah. do you mind if we enter from different gates? It's similar to when Ya'qub, Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam, when he advises his sons that don't all of you enter from the same gate. Because all mm. the boys are beautiful. Yes. And he doesn't want that hasad or that envy against mm. them. But for the daughters of Al Muhammad, the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, 50 years after their grandfather had passed away, they had lived a life where many had not even seen their faces before. Now they're about to enter a city, which they already know despises mm. them. Yes. But also now they're going to enter all together f from one door. And so the request wow. is made that you mind if we enter from different doors. Ease the tension a little. And he says, no way. Wow. He says, you're going to enter all of you together mm -hmm. from the same door. And naturally at this moment, the younger members of the family are in a state of distress. 
Because they know now that if Kufa was difficult, but at least Kufa had some of our dad's old yeah. supporters. Yes. Sham does not have any of them. And they knew that this is going to be their most difficult moment. Yeah. Wow. So we've, we've talked about Ali Muhammad coming in. What about the people around? I mean, what, what were they feeling? Was it animosity towards them? Or were they looking... Did they actually recognize these people? Oh, this was a, a day which was seen as a day of tabarruk, a day of barakah for wow. Bani Umayyah. The biggest proof of this was Sahel bin Sa'ad al-Sa'adi, companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is in mm -hmm. Sham at that time. Seemingly, he's on his way maybe towards the Bayt al-Maqdis, mm -hmm. towards Palestine, towards Jerusalem. And he's in absolute disbelief when he looks at this carnival-like atmosphere in Sham. Okay. Wow. It's a carnival-like atmosphere. But to celebrate the beheading of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Okay. And he describes this in his meeting with Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. That when, when Sahel meets Imam Zain al-Abideen, he mentions how he's not surprised if the earth now swallows its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. That people are in the streets merrymaking. You've read the line in Ziyarah. Mm. That this is a yom. Tabarrakat bihi al Umayyah. Wa al Abu Sufyan. That this is a day in which the family of Umayyah, the family of Abu Sufyan, found a day of enjoyment. Found it a day of celebration. Today you see that there are certain Muslims in the world. When it comes to the 10th of Muharram. They are constantly reminded of how Moses and the children of Israel were given victory. And mm -hmm. so now you have a lot of people stressing on the fasting on the day of Ashura. Say, for example, we have traditions about fasting. Let's say other schools have traditions about fasting on the day of Ashura. Yes. But when you know that the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad passed away, peace be upon him and his family on that day, how then do you have it in you to say, that today is a day we should celebrate, a day of joy, a day that we should all maybe even have wedding celebrations. I remember when I lectured in South Africa about, it was over 10 years ago now, I lectured in South Africa. I remember they were giving special offers on the 10th of Muharram. Wow. That if you want to book a wedding hall on the 10th of Muharram, you get 50% off the price. Seriously? Imagine. So what was instilled in the Umayyads at that time continues until today. That there are certain parts of the Muslim world. Someone recently done a survey in Egypt, in the streets of Egypt. Okay. He came to people in the streets in Egypt. And Egypt, the Egyptians tend to be people very well read. The prestigious Al-Azhar Seminary is yeah, there, yeah. you know? Quite, quite liberal, I assume. In all honesty, even the most liberal Egyptian knows more Quran than me and you. Awesome. You know, um, Egyptians uh, may not necessarily have the external image of religiosity. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, they can quote the Qur'an inside out. Mm -hmm. You can see an Egyptian serving shisha, yes, yes. or putting tobacco, or putting coal uh -huh. on your shisha when you're sitting in a calf, uh -huh. and he's quoting verses of the, of the Qur'an like you won't believe. Wow. You know? um, so they were coming to random people in the streets in Egypt, and they were asking them that, um, what's Ashura? Mm -hmm. 90%, 95% of the people didn't know. There was a few who said, is it something to do with Moses? Nobody knew it was about Imam al Hussein. Likewise, wow. you find that at that time, there was such a carnival atmosphere in Sham that people were celebrating like it was a day of Eid because Sahel bin Sa'ad asks people, is it a day of Eid? Mm -hmm. They're like, no, Hussein has been beheaded. And at that moment is when he says, I wouldn't be surprised if the earth swallows this all, our, all wow. its inhabitants. How could you people be celebrating the martyrdom of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family? Yeah. Some of uh, our elders used to narrate that as they were paraded, people said certain things to them, hurled abuse towards them, maybe throw stones and things like that. Is any of this true? Yes, certainly it's true. And you see the narrations... Um, from Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, mm -hmm. a few come to mind. 
The first of them is the narration that they were poking their spears into the waists of Allah the granddaughters Allah. of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Allah imagine, Allah. you know, the worst feeling when you try and imagine what was taking place is if these ladies are all chained up mm -hmm. and they all have to walk, you've got to remember some of them are kids, yes. some are ladies. That means some of these kids, one way or the other, would have had to have tiptoed yeah. to stay in line. There would have been cuts and bruises on them. But we have the traditions in the, in the narrative that uh, they were poking the spears into the waist of Sayyidah Zainab oh, alayhi salam, Allah. the granddaughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Likewise, you found that they began to hurl their insults. As I had mentioned that many of these people hated Imam Ali alayhi salam. Many of them or their relatives or their cousins would have been members of the fighting army, the rebellious group against Imam Ali al Safin. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what you find is that there are calls being made that these are the children of the man who killed your ancestors at Khandaq and Khaybar. Mm -hmm. Now to come out and take your revenge. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine there were some bloodthirsty people. Yes. There. They hated Ali. These are the children of Ali. Mm -hmm. In reflection of what Imam al Hussein salam on the 10th of Muharram, when mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein salam came out and he said, I'm the son of Fatima Zahra, am I not the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad? Why do people want to kill me? And they replied, Revenge for your father, Ali. Yeah. So now they take out their vengeance. So, firstly, poking spears, pelting stones, shouting out that these are the children mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the one who defeated you at Khandaq and Khaybar. And then, fourthly, and very interestingly, and very sadly, imagine they were gathering bowls of hot water Allah. and throwing it on the turban of Imam Zain al Abidin. Imam Zain al Abidin says that when we first began to walk in Sham, in the first of Safa, when we walked in, we had someone who poured boiling water on my turban. So, what has been narrated in the Majalis, a lot of it is true, that they really had to face a barrage, it was an absolute barrage of attacks against them from the bloodthirsty Umayyads and their supporters at the time. Yeah. Wow. And then, I mean, where were they being taken towards? Uh, the parade in the streets, obviously, but were they going towards Yazid's palace? Were they yeah, so they would have been taken towards ruins, similar ruins mm -hmm. to the ones in Kufa. Okay. So in Kufa, they would have been made to sleep next to the sheep and the camels. Okay. Imagine the grandchildren Oof. of the man who bought the religion. You make them sleep next to the feces of sheep, the feces of camel, with no proper shelter as such. There's not roofs on top of their heads. Mm -hmm. And Yazid really wants them to stay there for a certain period because he's invited ambassadors from different countries. Yes. He wants to show a display of his power. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very difficult moments now because you've already lost a daughter. You've lost two daughters. You've lost a daughter in, in Sinja. There's a couple, say the Khawla, Safiya, mentioned in Baalbek, okay. for example. Yes. So you've got a few daughters of Imam al Hussein who've already died on the way mm -hmm. to Sham. Now there's a few others Left. may not be physically tired. Mm -hmm which could lead to their deaths, but emotionally, hmm. every day is getting more and more difficult for them. So would you say something like that led to the death of Sayyidah Ruqayya? Yes, definitely. As in, we have these narrations that are mentioned by ulama. May Allah lengthen the life of Ayatollah Sadiq al-Rawhani. Talks about the young daughter of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Some mm -hmm. give different names for this young daughter. And you find that this young daughter, her auntie Zainab, naturally with a girl that young, you're not going to say to her, your father's died. So from Karbala to Kufa to Sham, mm -hmm. her auntie Zainab is just telling her, your dad's on a journey. Of course, he's yes. on a journey. Mm -hmm. The world of Barzakh and so on. So she's in the ruins with the rest of the family. And all of a sudden, there is this scream that wakes up everybody in the area. Now, their ruins are right next to Yazid's palace. Mm -hmm. And there's this loudest of screams, which wakes Yazid up. 
naturally wakes Sayyidah Zainab, wakes Imam mm -hmm. Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. And when it wakes them up, Sayyidah Zainab says to the young daughter of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, What is it? What's wrong with you? She says, I saw my father in my dream. Mm -hmm. And now I want to see him. He said that I'm going to go to him. I want to see him. It's been a number of days, it's been over, you know, mm. three weeks it's, since yes. I've seen my father. And my father used to look after me. My father mm. used to put me to bed. My father, I'd sit next to him when he's praying. I want to see my father. That scream when it wakes up Yazid, Yazid says, what was that scream? Mm -hmm. So they replied to him that that's the young daughter of Hussein. He says, what mm. does she want? Mm -hmm. They say to him, she wants to see her father. He said, very well, then let her see her father. They had the head of Imam al-Hussein next to them in their palaces. They used to poke the lips Allah. and the eyes of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. And they wanted to display this head and there was going to be a big parade to display the head. And they get the head and they place a cover like you're about to take a meal to somebody. Mm -hmm. You place a cover on top of a plate, the head is there. Yeah. And I don't expect anything more from someone who, you know, whose grandmother chewed the liver of Hamza, that he finds it normal to have yeah. anyone's head next to him. When they bring this plate with the head inside it and you've got the cover, yeah. she turns around to her auntie, Sayyidah Zainab, and she says, my auntie, I'm not hungry. Because what she assuming it is, it's, it's food. food. Yes. When she removes it, she sees the holy head of Imam al-Hussein. And the lines that are uttered, Father, who severed your head from your body? Father, who dyed your beard with blood? Father, who is there for the orphans after you? She let out every feeling that she's had but she had not wanted to say, who dyed your beard in blood? Who severed your head from your body? Who is there for the orphans of Al Muhammad after you? And she falls at that moment and dies. When she dies, they want one of the nurses to come and wash her body, do the burial rites. That nurse comes back to say to Zainab says, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So Zainab says, what's the problem? Says, was she ill when she died? So Sayyidah Zainab salam, says, no, she wasn't. She goes, then what's the blue marks all over her body? Allah. And at that moment, Sayyidah Zainab says, that's not the marks of illness, that's the marks of the whips of Shimmer and his soldiers. Imagine this lady who was about to wash the body of this young daughter of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, cannot bear to continue to wash because she's flabbergasted by the number of bruises. They had whipped mm. these women, they had hurt them, they had slapped them. And so you find that her grave is still there. Many Zawar. Mm -hmm. And Alhamdulillah, I think yourself and I, we've all had the privilege of having yeah. to be in to say the Ruqayya's grave in Sham. Nice. And inshallah, very soon we'll be able to return inshallah. there as well. Inshallah. So going back a little bit, we were discussing how uh, you know, the, the prisoners were uh, paraded, the captives were paraded. Um, how did uh, Yazid react to seeing or uh, being presented with Ali Muhammad in front of him in his courtyard? Well, he's, uh, he's in his full regalia, full pomp. Yeah. He wants to show off to all his ambassadors. Now, of course, these ambassadors, in some cases, maybe in religious, like, for mm -hmm. example, Christians. Remember Yazid's, um, Yazid's mother is a Christian. Okay. Yazid's father, Muawiyah, uh, publicly would say that he's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. But Yazid's mother, Maysoon, was a Christian. Yazid used to love the maternal side of his family. Mm -hmm. more than the paternal. Um, the Umayyads had a very, very close relationship with the Christian world. You look at later on the likes of the poet, you know, Al-Akhtal and others, mm -hmm. uh, Christian poets in the courts of Hisham and so on. 
So Yazid has got some people who may have been of the religion of Christianity, got others who have no religion whatsoever. And he wants to show them his power. What's interesting is that even if you're not a Muslim, when you're witnessing this scene, you may be a father. Mm -hmm. You're someone's brother, some sister. Yeah. You might be the uncle of a niece somewhere in the world. So you still got those feelings when you see yes. all these women being paraded. And so while he brings them out so he'll parade them, one of the Christian ambassadors who was sitting next to him says to him, who are these people? Are they the grandchildren of the man who bought the religion for you people? Mm -hmm. Are they Muhammad's grandchildren? Yeah. Yes, he says to him, what does that have to do with you? He goes, listen, we had the print of the hoof of the donkey mm -hmm. that was sat on by one of the prophets of God in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Until today, we honor the print of the hoof of the, of the donkey, donkey of that prophet. Mm -hmm. And your prophet's grandchildren, you're parading them? And your prophet's grandson, you put his head on a chessboard next to you for people to look at and laugh? Mm -hmm. Yazid says to him, if you don't shut your mouth, I'll kill you. He ends up, he ends up killing wow. him. That was the beginning of things going wrong for Yazid. Because... Mm -hmm. Yazid had calculated that this is all going to go smooth. I've got mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to worry about. We're going to be victorious. We're going to parade. We're going to have people who are going to laugh and smile. And now he begins to notice that mm -hmm. there's an utterance of disrespect. And he wants that person killed. Then to some ambassadors who are sitting there, he tells them, pick one of the girls. Mm -hmm. And one of the ambassadors sitting there says, that one over there, I want her. Mm -hmm. And she holds on to her auntie, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Says, my auntie, is it not enough what they did to us on the 10th of Muharram? That now are they going to take us as slaves? Mm -hmm. And Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam says, that you know what, don't worry. There is no way that I'll allow him to touch you. Mm -hmm. He notices that Sayyidah Zainab is really beginning to get in his way. Everything mm -hmm. that he's trying, people are speaking out against. Naturally, with that insecurity at that moment, mm -hmm. the arrogance emerges. And he utters lines taken from a, 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 a jahil poet, but he changes a few of the words and he says, to hurt Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. He says, Later, Ashiyakhi bi Badrin shahidu. Jaza al Khazraj min waqa al Asan. La hellu was the hellu faraha, thumma kalu ya yazid la tushan. La ibat hashim bil mulk. Fella khabarun ja awala wahyun nazan. He begins to make this statement in front of everybody that I wish my ancestors from Badr were here today. <laughs> I ask you, Sayyid Muhsin, I ask the viewers. Yazid, who is his ancestors from Badr? Were they on the side of Rasulullah, the opposite side? Opposite. His mother or his grandmother Hind. Grandmother, yeah. Her father, Utbah bin Rabi'ah, was killed mm. on the day of Badr. Al Walid was killed. Shaiba was killed. Abu Sufyan and Hind were also orchestrators. Mm -hmm. When he says later, Ashiyakhi bi Badr and Shahidu, I wish. My ancestors who died at Badr could see mm -hmm. what I've done today. That I'm poking the lips of the head, of the face, of the son of the man who defeated you at Badr. I've taken revenge. This piece of poetry, what he's trying to do really at this moment, he's trying to cover his insecurities. Mm -hmm. he, he knows that this is a very difficult time for him. So he's trying to cover his angles, trying to cover all of his insecurities. And then at the end, he says a line which is his kufr, his disbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, many of our Sunni brothers and sisters despise Yazid. Mm -hmm. The revamping of the image of Yazid bin Muawiyah is a Salafi Wahhabi revamp. Mm -hmm. 
Some will say, for example, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal or Ibn Taymiyyah or others say, okay, the main thing is you don't curse him. If you don't like him, don't curse. But you find that many of the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah used to despise Yazid. Yazid, there was no discussion about him. Especially with the lines of لَعِبَتْ Hashim bil mulk فَلَا خَبَرٌ جَاءَ وَلَا وَحْيٌ نَزَلٌ Hashim played with a mulk. Hashim, Bani Hashim. Yeah. They played with a kingdom. Mm -hmm. There was no news. There's no revelation. All this Jibra'i mm -hmm. is all nonsense. When he's saying this, لَا خَبَرٌ جَاءَ وَلَا وَحْيٌ نَزَلٌ in other words, what he's saying is that this is all nonsense. Anyone who's telling you that Muhammad received revelation, this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. It shows you that the Umayyads, in many cases, did not believe in Muhammad as Rasulullah. Unless it suited their government, unless it suited their power base. Awesome. But what's going on right now is that it's shaky ground for him. He thinks that all of the pomp and the regalia and the royalty and the ambassadors, he thinks that's over. Zainab has something coming for him. And that's the moment you'd think that this lady, after Karbala, Kufa, you'd think that, you know what, surely she's tired. Yeah. You'd think that this is the end. And she delivers a sermon in reply to his words where she absolutely destroys him. Yeah. So in terms of Say the Zainab's uh, sermon. I mean, were, did, did she just come up with it, or was she, you know, who, who kind of instigated it? Was was it? Why why didn't Imam Sajjad speak beforehand, or someone else? Did it have to be Say the Zainab to speak? And what? Well, did they she both say? give a sermon. She's already defended the daughters of Rasulullah. Yeah. She's already um, seen the insults that he's leveled towards her, and. She emerges with a sermon which I personally believe that many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt should memorize by the age of 16. Mashallah. I believe that if you can memorize Sayyidah Zainab's sermon in Sham, she had already given a sermon in Kufa. But if you're able to memorize Sayyidah Zainab's sermon in Sham, there are so many profound lessons in this sermon. She begins, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. There's, there's a lesson in every line of this khutbah. When I've seen what I've seen in Karbala, would I still believe in Allah? There are some of us, exam result goes wrong, <laughs> uh, is there a God? Yeah. A friend of ours dies, is there a God? Mm. We're told we have cancer, is there a God? We lose our job, where is the God? Sayyidah Zainab gives us one fundamental lesson right from the beginning. All praise is due to Allah. Whatever I face in life, as her father Imam Ali salam, said wonderfully, do not say, Ya Allah, don't test me, for Allah will definitely test you. Rather say, Ya Allah, do not test me with that which shakes my faith in you. Any other test I welcome. But Masha don't Allah. test me with that which shakes my faith in you. MashaAllah. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. And peace and blessings be on his prophet. The only lady probably who could ever say that comfortably because that's her granddad. Yes. And peace and blessings be on his prophet. Straight away to Quran. Because when you have the Quran, you truly have the pillar for you to be eloquent, for you to be confident, for you to have points of wisdom, she straight away quotes from the Quran. Allah was right when he said evil will be the end for those who committed evil because they rejected our communications and used to mock at them. She's telling him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was right when he said evil will be the end for those who committed evil because they rejected our communications and used to mock at them. O oh, Yazid, do you think that God has made you honorable and made us contemptible? Now that in your belief you've blocked the earth's zones and the heaven's horizons and you've left no solution for us. Do you think it's your reputation before God that has led you to this victory? You crow with pleasure now that the world has turned for you and our affairs are allocated to you. 
and our government has arranged for you. Get off your high horse. Get off your high horse. You know who you're talking to? Exactly. Yeah, you're talking to Yazid bin Muawiyah, <laughs> caliph of the Muslims at that time. Get off your high horse. Have you not read in the Quran when Allah says, let not those who disbelieve Quran again. Let not those who disbelieve think that our granting them respite we, is good for their souls. Rather, we grant them respite so they may add to their sins. Keep living. Right. Add, add. Because for you, there's a painful chastisement. He's silent. He can't utter a word. Mm -hmm. Because Zainab السلام, when she talked, people used to say, is that Ali ibn Abi Talib talking? The eloquence was phenomenal. Get off your high horse. The Quran says, let not those who disbelieve like you think that when we give them a long life, it's good for their souls. Rather, we give them a long life so they may add to more sins. For them, there is a painful chastisement. O oh, Yazid, O oh, you whose father Muawiyah was freed by my grandfather Rasulullah, because Muawiyah is of the Tulaqa, okay. freed on the day of the opening of Mecca. Mm -hmm. Is it fair that your wives are behind a curtain and the daughters of Rasulullah are taken from city to city? Is it fair that you disgrace us by unveiling our faces? Sometimes people ask, what's the covering of Sayyidah Zainab? And sometimes people want to wear hijab, but they're not sure. Sometimes people want to take that step, they're not sure. Sometimes people say, I'm not ready. Sometimes people say, out there it's pressure. You'll never ever in your life see pressure like Zainab, daughter of Ali in Sham, with the haters of her father surrounding her. That's pressure. You know, we say, the examples are given but should not be. Never, these are trivial examples, mm -hmm. yes? A person taking a penalty in a five-a-side game with their friends mm -hmm. is different from a person who's about to take the match-winning penalty in the European Cup final. You agree? Agreed. Having taken penalties. There you go. <laughs> so when you come to someone like Sayyidah Zainab salam, someone today in London or someone in America says to me, Sayyidina, I'm not sure if I should wear hijab or not. Because there's Islamophobia, there's pressure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Look at Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. She makes it clear to Yazid that you've disgraced us by unveiling our faces. faces. Get our hair. Mm -hmm. By unveiling our faces. faces so that all could see us. From the strangers to the acquaintances. There's two types of people. There's people we don't know, they're looking at our faces. Mm -hmm. But there's people we used to know, used to respect us. Mm -hmm. You made us walk through Kufa in front of friends of my father. Mm -hmm. From the stranger to the acquaintance, from the noble to the ignoble. Mm -hmm. From those who have respect, but also in front of those people who pelted stones on us. While there is none to defend us. But how could I hope for sympathy and compassion from someone whose grandmother chewed the liver of the nobles? And he was born from the flesh of the martyrs. His grandmother Hind, who mm -hmm. chewed the liver of Hamza. You see what Sayyidah Zainab is doing? Mm -hmm. She's telling him what? You think you won? Yes. While I'm here, you don't win. And while I'm here, my grandfather's message will never die. My grandfather's message lives forever. Awesome. So you see this introduction is shaken the whole of Shan. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, we'll continue shortly to see what she says in the rest of the sermon. Because I know you're giving me that look of, <laughs> of the break and it's about time that we move on. Asal yep. Sheikhna. Respected viewers, we're going for a short break, but please join us after the break as we continue the discussion of Zainab in the court of Yazid. And if you have any questions that you'd like to send in, please call us on 0203 515 And also the WhatsApp number will be down at the bottom where you can send in your questions. We'll see you shortly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dear respected viewers and welcome back to Live in London For the second part of the show of Karbala to Kufa If you have a question and you'd like to call in Please call on 0203-515-0199 Or if you'd like to send a question in The WhatsApp number should be on the screen Sayyidah Mar, assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalam wa We were discussing uh, Sayyidah Zainab in the courts of Yazid And she was giving a sermon Please continue Yes, yeah, so she's now uh, begun her speech and she's in riveting form. She's reminding him that, listen, you're, you're a person, if you want to know your background, my grandfather is the one who freed uh, your father. father yeah. uh, your grandmother is the one who chewed the liver of the nobles. And then she looks at him and she says, but you know what's ridiculous about all of this and what's so sad you don't view yourself as a sinner hmm. and you don't look down at this mortal blow you boast about your disbelieving ancestors wishing that they were present so that they could see what you've done you've shed the blood of the progeny of Abd al-Muttalib the heavenly stars on earth hmm. but we'll be patient since soon you'll be joining them. Then you'll wish that you would not have said what you said or acted what you've acted. Oh Yazid, by Allah you've cloven your own skin and flesh. Soon you'll meet the messenger of Allah. And it's at that moment where Allah turns distress into tranquility. You've held his children as captives and you've disgraced them. And then she utters another eye of the Quran. But do not count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Rather they are alive mm -hmm. receiving sustenance from their Lord. A martyr doesn't die. A martyr's body, mm -hmm. physical body dies. But the legacy of a martyr never dies. Those who paved the way for you, Yazid, to dominate over us. Whoever was involved mm -hmm. in paving the way for you to dominate over us, meaning whoever paved the way for your father to become governor of Sham and gave him that much power 40 years before Karbala, all of those are involved in the massacre of Imam Hussein. Because you know, today when a massacre happens with ISIS, people will say you can't blame what happened a thousand years ago on ISIS today. Mm -hmm. Sayyidina Zainab says to Yazid, there are those who paved the way for you to dominate. There are those whose decisions are decisions that led to you dominating. But enough for us is that we have Rasulullah, we have Jibra'il. They are our supporters. We don't need any of these people. Then she says something to him which really brings him down and embarrasses him. I believe we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is uh, Minhal Khafaji. I'm calling from London. And uh, my question was to the Sayyid um, Do you have the likes of the people, Shibis bar Rib'i, for example, who was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and was a governor for Amir al Mumini alayhi salam? What is it that makes a person go from such ranks? And, and turns against the grandson of the Prophet. And were there any people from Karbala to the Damascus? Were there people that actually came and repented to Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam? Were there people that actually came and sought forgiveness? Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa habibi. Thank you very much for your question, Sayyidina. Yes, thank you, Minhal, for your excellent questions. You're looking at someone like, for example, Shibth bin Rab'i and say, how could someone like that change? There are some that never change, but their silence is just as bad. Mm -hmm. Zayd bin Arqam, Abdullah bin Umar, Sahel bin Sa'ad. These are all companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, who were alive. Okay, they did not have the 180 degree, for example, change of someone like him, but they were silent. But it's not surprising to find people who do have these changes. 
when the companions were killing each other on the day of the Battle of Jemen, they were killing each other. Now, today you have people saying, oh, it's a uh, fitna, oh, the Jews did it, oh, oh, oh. The reality is that we have a battle where you've got four or five of those who are supposedly granted paradise all wanting to kill each other. Mm -hmm. It happens. But I think the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, gave more than enough guidance for people. It's whether they want to take it or not. Sometimes, subhanAllah, this is tawfiq from Allah. How many times we say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada. وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ All praise is due to Allah who guided us to this. And we would never have been guided if it wasn't for Allah's Allah. guidance. Ascent. Anytime that you're on the path of guidance in salah, every day you, you are told. There's one line you have to say in salah every single day about guidance. Which line? اِهْدِنَا الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Likewise, in our supplication, say, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, Thabbit Qalbi ala Deenik. O oh Allah, the Manifestant, the Merciful, the one who rotates the heart, cement my heart on your path. Because, subhanAllah, there are people who are miles away from the path of God. Within a few moments, they become Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi. And there are others who are supposedly on the path of God and their arrogance or their love of this world overtakes them. Ascent. Say now, I believe we have another caller on the line. Sure. Caller, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Your name and where you're calling from? Hello, Assalamu alaikum. I'm afraid we've got some technical difficulties. The caller's not there. If you can, call back and we'll try to get you through to the show. Say we go back to Minhal's second question. Okay. That were there people who came to Imam Zain al Abidin seeking repentance? There's a whole movement which you could mm. read in many of the books of Islamic history known as the Tawwabun. Okay. From the word Tawbah. Tawbah. Uh -huh. Tawbah is when a person seeks to repent. They seek Allah's forgiveness and they seek to return back to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Tawwabun were a group of people, the likes of Sulaiman bin Sard al-Khaza'i and others, who felt guilty that they did not help Imam al Hussein at mm -hmm. Karbala. And these people sincerely sought to repent after Karbala. So that's an example of a group of people which you could refer to. Ahsan, Sayyidina Ahsan. I believe we have another caller on the line. Sure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your name, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm Dinesh. I'm calling from Dubai. I'd uh, like to ask two questions with Sayyid. Tafazir, Ahmed, Sahni. Sure, go ahead. I'd like to ask the, whether Bibi Zainab and the other family members of Prophet Muhammad, how long were they imprisoned by Yazid? I never get this answer from any Alama clearly that uh, for how many days they were imprisoned. And uh, to add on to that, that when did uh, they come back to Karbala to bury the dead bodies of Imam Hussain, Hussain and his uh, followers? The other shahadas. These are the two questions I would like to get clear about. Sure. Thank you sure, very much for your so question. Much. Salam alaikum. In my opinion, and the opinion of some of our greatest ulama, mm -hmm. I remember once again Ayatollah Salih Rouhani being asked this question. And I know very well that one of our great scholars, uh, Sheikh Al Qurbasi, one of our great scholars who has done in, 100 no, volumes in, in London. London. Yes, He's in, London, in yeah. London, who has done so much work on Imam al Hussein. Mm -hmm. They are of the opinion that the journey from Karbala to Kufa to Sham, back to Karbala, was a 40 day journey. Wow. They do not take the opinion that the family of the Prophet stayed in Sham in prison for one mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. There may be the odd solitary report about a year in prison. They do not take this. They rather take the opinion that while they were in Sham from the 1st of Safar, for example, to just after the 10th of Safar, and from there they took the shorter route back to Karbala, Karbala. to arrive at Karbala on the 20th of Safar. Safar. Yeah, in the same year, not the following mm, year. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is the second question in regards to the burials. Yeah. Did that happen on the return or did that Yes, the, burial, the, the burials happened a couple of days after mm -hmm. um, Imam al-Hussein died. He was buried. 
but without the heads. The heads, according to the opinions of some of the scholars, were taken back to the bodies upon the return to Karbala after Sham. Hassan, yeah. Hassan Sayyidna, thank you very much. Let's return to our discussion in regards to Sayyidina Zainab. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 so midway through her sermon, mm -hmm. there is a moment where all of a sudden she says, although the plight has made me speak to you, mm -hmm. me and you never chat. Because someone like him is the scum of the earth. Yes. Me and you don't chat. Mm -hmm. But the plight has led to me speaking to you. Although the plight has made me speak to you, I find speaking to you of little value, Yazid. But scolding you, I find great. <laughs> Therefore, I'll continue to scold you. Anyone who tells me that in Islam, a woman has no voice, come watch Zainab and Sham. Mm -hmm. Although the plight has made me speak to you, I find speaking to you of little value. But scolding you, I find great. Therefore, I'll continue to scold you. The eyes are tearful. And the heart is sorrowful. How ironic it is that the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members of the party of Shaytan. She has just made it clear that Yazid bin Muawiyah, mm -hmm. anyone who later one day comes and says, May Allah be pleased with him, Radi Allah and Khalif of the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members mm -hmm. of the party of Shaytan. Shaytan leaving their bodies alone on the grounds of Karbala. But then she says, you know what, Yazid, your government's unstable. Mm -hmm. She's seen what's going on. This government's unstable. Your ideas are transitory. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yazid, however hard you try. And this is the most powerful moment in Shah. Oh, Yazid, however hard you try. You'll never remove our love and our memory from the hearts of the people. Karbala today. How many years it's been? Karbala today. You go to Europe. There are remembrance of Imam Hussein. Middle East. Remembrance of Imam Hussein. South America. Remembrance of Imam Hussein. North America. Remembrance of Imam Hussein. Africa. Remembrance of Imam Hussein. The Far East. Australia, remember Sayyidina Muhammad. Wherever you go in the world, mm -hmm. what Sayyidina Zainab said to Yazid, however hard you try, you kill my brother, you're humiliating mm -hmm. us, you'll never obliterate our love and our memory from the hearts mm -hmm. of the people. That will never happen. Wow. All of us grow up on the love of Zainab. Definitely. All of us grow up on the love of Imam Al-Hussein and Imam Al-Sadiq. And they tried to obliterate. Mutawakkil tried to destroy the graves of the Ahlul Bayt. Others tried to, Saddam Hussein in 91 mm -hmm. and his son-in-law Hussein Kamil tried to destroy the shrine of Imam Hussein in Karbala. We're here. We're here. They tried to destroy the grave of Sayyidina Zainab in Sham. We're here. However hard you try, you'll never obliterate our love and our memory from the hearts of the people. I believe we have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah sister. Your question please. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, sister, we can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Another technical difficulty there. I do apologize to the viewers. If you are having technical diff difficulties getting through, please hang up and try again, and inshallah, we'll get your question onto uh, the Sayyid and onto the show. Sayyidna, the love of the Ahlul Bayt, you will never. Yeah, you'll never them. obliterate our love and our memory from the hearts of the people. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Allah. You've lost Aun, you lost Muhammad, you lost Abbas, you lost Hussein. But Allah says in the Quran, لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Be thankful to me, I'll give you more, don't worry. I'll make sure that you're not ever forgotten. I thank Allah who gave us martyrdom and who gave us blessings. And all mm -hmm. I ask from Allah is to recompense those martyrs at Karbala, those who have lost their lives. Ya Allah, reward them for what they've done. Yazid has no reply. And can you imagine Imam Zain al-Abideen now? 
Imam of Al Muhammad. What's his eloquence going to be like? And Imam Zainab Abidin up to this point. Some don't even know who he is. What's your name? Ali ibn Hussein. We killed Ali ibn Hussein at Karbala. No, that was Akbar. This is another one. Mm -hmm. So now there's a double whammy. There's a, you know, a mm -hmm. double combo about to attack Yazid. Mm -hmm. That Imam Zainab Abidin now is going to say to him, You think that my auntie Zainab could speak? Mm hmm. You're not ready for what you're going to hear. And Imam Zain Abdin begins. Allah has granted us six and given us excellence in seven. Awesome. He has granted us knowledge and patience and eloquence and generosity and the believer's affection for us. Knowledge requires patience and the eloquence to deliver it. Awesome. But generosity from the human being to give away. But also, all of this will not be complete without the believers and their affection for us. And he has given us excellence in seven. From us as the Holy Prophet, from us as Ali, from us as Ja'far, from us as Hamza, from us as who? Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. Awesome. And the Mahdi, yes. Awesome. I believe we have a call sure on the good. line. Inshallah, we'll get through this time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. I do apologize for that. I believe we have some more technical difficulties. Um, but please keep trying to call in, and inshallah, we'll get your question onto the show. We've had some callers already before. And uh, the technical staff are telling me now that all lines are clear and are working. So please try calling again and we'll get you onto the show, inshallah. Allah has given us excellence in seven. Yes. And he mentions them. From us, not from a random person. From mm -hmm. us is Rasulullah, from us is Ali, from us is Ja'far al tayyar mm -hmm. from us is Hamza, yeah. Sayyid al-Shuhada. From us, Imam Hassan, okay. Imam Hussein. Okay. The then he looks thing. around at everyone and says, those of you who know me, know me. Mm -hmm. Those of you who don't, let me tell you who I am. Do you know what he's doing at that moment? I'm going to kill off all the propaganda. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kill it off. I am the son of Mecca and Mina. You claim to all be Muslims? Mm -hmm. I'm the son of Mecca and Mina. I'm the great grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. What are you? Mm -hmm. I'm the son of Mecca and Mina. I'm the son of Zamzam and Safa. Mm -hmm. You don't suffer Marwa? Yes. Zamzam water? Yes. I'm the son of that. The Meaning that all of that, mm -hmm. you know it because of my grandfather. That's it. I am the son of the man who was the greatest to circumambulate the Kaaba and the man who held the black stone within his Abba. I am the son of the man who was taken by Burak through the air. Wow. Mi'raj. I am the son of the man who led the angels in prayer. prayer. I am the son of the man who was taken to Sidratul Munta. I am the son of Muhammad al Mustafa. Sallallahu alayhi wa Then he says, I am the son of Ali al Murtaba, the man who fought the disbelievers until mm -hmm. they said, La ilaha illallah. Mm. Yes. It's always interesting when you forget your phone. <laughs> um, I am the son of the man who fought the disbelievers until they said, La ilaha illallah. Ilaha illallah. Now he begins with the merits of Imam Ali. What did I say at the beginning of the show? At the mm -hmm. beginning of the show, I said that in Sham there was the hatred of Ali. Yes. The Umayyad aim was to remove Ali from mm -hmm. the history. history. Yes. Listen to the way he describes Imam Ali ibn Talib mm -hmm. I'm the son of Ali al Murtada, the man who fought the disbelievers until they said, La ilaha illallah. I'm the son of the man who fought with two swords and with two spears and went on two migrations and fought at Badr and at Hunayn. I am the son of the believer's pious one, the descendant of the prophets, annihilator of the polytheists, commander of the faithful, glory of the worshippers, honorable of the criers. That description is shaking Umayyah. Mm -hmm. He's shaking them. Mm -hmm. You know who Ali ibn Talib is? Believers, pious one, mm -hmm. descendant of the prophets, annihilator of the polytheists, mm 
Yeah. Commander of the faithful, glory of the worshippers, honorable of the criers, the best of them in prayer. I am the son of the man who was the arrow of God targeting the hypocrites. Awesome. And the gardens of the treasures of his wisdom, the best amongst the people in prayer. I am the son of the man who was assisted by Jibra'il and Mikael. I am the son of the man who was a Makki and a Madani, and a Khaifi and a Aqabi, and a Muhajiri and an Ansari. The inheritor of the Mash'ari, the father of Hassan and Hussein. That's my grandfather, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he says, I'm the son of the woman who was deemed pure on the earth, Fatima al Zahra. Then he says, I'm the son of the man whose body lies on the ground in Karbala. At that moment, Yazid knows. That this sermon has not just included the things that Umayyads always used to make fun of, such as mm -hmm. the Mi'raj. Yes. Has also included the Fada'il of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi mm -hmm. And no majlis can be complete without Fada'il of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Yazid knows. Now he's got to stop this. What does Yazid do? Let the Adhan be recited. <laughs> Cut the sermon. Let the Adhan be recited. Was it actually time for Salah at that time? <laughs> if, uh, if his father could make Salat al-Jum'ah on a Wednesday, who cares what time? So clearly Yazid was shaken by all of this. He's thing. shaken and he's now said that um, let the Adhan be recited. And that's one of my theories for why they haven't stayed in the prison for a year. Because I believe mm -hmm. that those sermons have shaken him that he's got to let go of them. Yeah. Otherwise, if they gave those sermons mm -hmm. and, it's done, and he keeps them in prison for a year, that means those sermons didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But those sermons shook the crowd. People were beginning yeah. to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And the Adhan recited, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Imam Zain al Abin says, Truly the Lord is the greatest. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. My tongue and my skin and my flesh all testify that there is Only one no one God but Allah. Allah. Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. He asked him, Yazid, is he your grandfather or is mine? Mm -hmm. If you say he's yours, you're a liar. If you say he's mine, then why have you done this to the family? Mm -hmm. Yazid's finished now. Finished in which sense? Yazid bin Muawiyah stays in power for two years after Karbala. Waqa'at al-Harra, Waqa'at al-Hurra, which is mentioned when he pillages mm -hmm. Medina and Mecca, that happens after Karbala. But he wanted to embarrass Al-Muhammad. At the end, he himself is embarrassed. And he tells Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, okay, what do you want? She said, what you took from me, you can never give back. What do you want? She said, let us return back to Medina. Via Karbala. Mm -hmm. Say the Zainab and Imam Zainab Abideen in two sermons rock the foundation of the Umayyads in Shah. The Umayyads ruled after Karbala for over 60 years, but never in a comfortable position. They either had to have bloodthirsty governors mm -hmm. to quell any movement of an uprising, your Zayd bin Ali's, your Muhtar al Thaqafis, your internal battles and struggles, your later Abbasid uprising. But that was the beginning of when people noticed that you know what, you can speak out and you can attack them. And from there, the family went towards Karbala. And the narration mentioned that as they went towards Karbala on the 20th of Safar, Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari with Atiyah al-Awfi mm -hmm. came towards Karbala. Yeah. So what was it like uh, for them returning to Karbala? I mean, you've already stated that they weren't in prison for a, a year, most likely. So if you could, you know, what, what happened? How, how were they released then? And then what was the journey like? Yeah, so we said that Karbala? they weren't in prison for a year. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to be released and they went towards Karbala. This time, much easier for them to go to, towards Karbala. But definitely not emotionally easy. Mm -hmm. You've got to bury the heads back with the bodies. It's a difficult moment. And you know, for the likes of Sayyidah Zainab, Rabab, you know, the children, going back to those holy bodies. 
But subhanAllah, the Zawar continued to honor the 20th of Safar every year when we go for Arba'een. That people flock in their millions. Indeed. Because they wanted to honor that lady and the way she made sure that Karbala was not to be forgotten. You see, when Imam Ali died, people put the blame on Ibn Mulja. Mm -hmm. When Imam Al-Hassan died, people put the blame on his wife, right. Jahda. Mm -hmm. Nobody said Muawiyah had anything to do with it. With Imam Ali, Muawiyah said, oh, I was also a victim of an assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. When Imam Al-Hassan died, no one said Muawiyah sent poison to Jahda to kill him. Yeah. With Imam Al Hussein, Yazid would have got away with killing Imam, would have got away with, with the killing of Imam Hussein because he would say, I was in Sham, Hussein was killed in Karbala. Mm -hmm. Were it not for Zainab facing him one on one in Sham. Ascent. We can never, ever appreciate what Zainab done alayhi salam for the religion of Islam. But one way we could show is by going on the Arba'een, on the 40th, to go and visit her holy grave, if not her grave, the grave of Abu Abdullah Al Hussein. Definitely. Where we can all go, and you see now over 20 million people. Yes. We'll be going to Karbala in the first week of November. And I tell all the viewers out there, if you haven't been to Karbala, then you haven't lived. Imam al sadiq says, اغفر لي ولإخواني وزوار قبر أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام. Oh Allah, forgive me and my brothers and the visitors to the grave of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Those who spend their money to go see him. They put their bodies in danger. Ziyara can be dangerous. Yeah, I, I remember last year, I believe I was with you when I went to um, Samara. I think a day after the a yes. bomb exploded. Yes. yes. رغبة في برنا ورجاء لما عندك في وصلتنا وسرورا أدخله على نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله. They they come because they want to maintain their relation with us mm -hmm. and they want to put a smile on the face of Rasul Allah that awesome. someone's come to visit Imam Al Hussein عليه السلام. Imam Al Sadiq continues by saying فرحم تلك الخدود التي تقلبت على ضريح أبي عبد الله وعلى قبر أبي عبد الله. Have mercy on the cheeks that rub themselves on the grave okay. of Abu Abdullah. Warham lana. Have mercy on those eyes that shed tears for us. Warham lana. Have mercy on those hearts that burn for us. Warham shams. Have mercy on those faces that the sun burnt. Hot weather. But they walk to Karbala yeah. just to honor that journey. Imam al Sadiq tells Muawiyah bin Wahab at the end of that dua Allahumma in yastawda'aka tilka al anfus wa tilka al abdan hatta turawiyahum min al hawdi yawm al atash. Ya Allah, these Zawar of Hussein, I leave them in your hands on the day of judgment that you quench their thirst from the pool of Kofa. On the day when all are thirsty. So Ahl al-Bayt give great value that in the same way Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari went to visit the grave of Imam al-Hussein on the 20th of Safa. <clears throat> Likewise, we should undertake the same. Definitely, definitely. To the brothers and sisters watching, we've only got about 10-12 minutes of the show left. And if you'd like to call in with a question to the Sayyid Ammar, please call us on 0203-515-0199. So, um, Sayyidina, we were talking about, you know, the journey coming into, uh, into Sham, the people there, um, and, and, and the atrocities and what's happened to Ali Muhammad. What about those in Medina? What about the family that were waiting for them? Mm. Um, I mean, how, for example, Umm al -Banin. Yes. How did, how did she get, uh, how did they get news? It's devastating of, when of, you hear Umm al -Banin, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas yes. and his three brothers, so four mm -hmm. sons killed at Karbala. Bishr bin Hadlam is the one who calls out that there is news from Karbala. And when she comes to wanting to hear the news, she's got the child of Abel Fadl in her hand. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine a mom who doesn't know about what's happened to her sons? And then all of a sudden someone comes and says, I've got news about the people's sons. Who wants to know? She says, tell us about Karbala. And he says, who is that lady? 
And they tell him, you don't know her, that's Umm al-Baneen. So he says to her, may Allah reward you over the death of your son, Abdullah. She says, tell me about Abba oh, Abdullah. Whose mother is she? Son, the Abu Fadl Allah. Abbas, who does she say tell me about? Abu Abdullah. Look at her. Look at that mm -hmm. unbelievable level of Iman. Your son is Abbas. No, no, no. Tell me about Hussein. He's the Imam of my time. May Allah reward you over the death of your son Ja'far. Tell me about Abu Abdullah. May Allah reward you over the death of your son Uthman. May Allah. She says, tell me about Abu Abdullah. Then he says to her, may Allah reward you over the death of your son Abbas. She drops the child. But she still stands up and says, tell me about Abu Abdullah. And that's why one of the poets says it quite beautifully, that it's as if Umm al-Baneen is saying, if you gave me the heavens and the earth and you gave me 70 Abbas, hmm. I'll swap all of them to see Imam al Hussein's head in peace. That's the love she wow. had. Devastating. But she goes to console Sayyidah Zainab with mm -hmm. Sayyidah Fidda. All of them are sitting together there. Consoling one another. Mm -hmm. And then you've got daughter, a daughter of Imam Hussein who was waiting for news. You've got Abdullah bin Ja'far al-Tayyar waiting to meet Sayyidah Zainab. So that period is an extremely tragic period. It's sad. It's, it's for Rabab, the mother of the six-month-old baby. She doesn't even want a roof on top of her head. She cannot mm -hmm. bear the idea that she's being covered from sunlight and her husband Imam Hussein was burnt by the sun in Karbala. Yeah, it's difficult time. Oh, so. Say so now with your permission, can we take some questions? We've sure, got go loads and loads of um, a lot are asking for the topics and the discussion we've had today in regards to the journey back and, and what's happened in the court of Yazid. Uh, any good English literature to go alongside the, the discussion at all? I think um, Ansarian publications in Qom yeah, published a work yeah. about seven, eight years ago called The Tragic Saga of Karbala. Mm -hmm. The tragic saga of Karbala. I think it's a good narrative, which includes all of this uh, journey. Ascent, ascent. Another question here. I have heard that historians say that Imam Hussein alayhi salam had a combined army of 5,000. Is it true? If yes, then why do we always talk about the 72? No. So, more on to how many people were actually uh, with, no, I'd with say, Imam I'd Hussein. I'd say maximum alayhi numbers, alayhi companions, plus family members, plus those who. Joined his side on the 10th of Muharram. And the women and uh, yeah, the I'd children. Yeah, you're coming to a maximum with all of them to about 120. Um, let's say maybe on, you know, coming into Karbala, some figures go up to 600. Wow. But coming into Karbala. Mm -hmm. But then those who leave, leave those who go leave, back and so yeah. on, and ends up with maximum 120 on the 10th of Muharram. Yeah. A lot of questions are asking about your personal email or some way they can contact you. Do you actually have a website or anything that you know the viewers can actually come and send direct personal questions? They have. Well, I think if any of the viewers want to contact Imam Al Hussein TV, mm -hmm. the admin team here, we'll be more than happy you to just take you on the email, right? For yeah. said Amar Al sh uh, show, sure. you know, for the live. No worries. Show and then we can try and answer as for, many as for possible. For the viewers, uh, the email is actually info at imamhussein.tv. That's info at imamhussein.tv. Uh, we were more than happy to forward your questions on to Sayyid Amar. Um, a question here, a little bit off topic, but what are the other schools under the Shia community other than the Jafri school of thought? You have the Zaydi school, which goes up to Imam Zain al Abidin and then goes to his son, so, yeah, Zayd. Zayd. And then you have the Ismaili school. Which goes to Imam al-Sadiq and then from there to his son Ismail onwards. Yeah. This is a very actually good question, very relevant. According to your uh, research, my question is: When did Lady Zainab introduce Latam? As soon as, as some people say, she did it to encourage the remembrance of Karbala. So I want to know how she introduced and incorporated such things. If there are merits of doing these uh, of it, and it's, or, or is it just tradition? So, a question in regards to the Aza and forms of Aza, Latam, wearing black. Uh, I mean, was this actually introduced by the Ahlul Bayt themselves or, or not? Well, in Ziyarat al Nahiya, mm -hmm. we have the lines that the woman of Al Muhammad, upon seeing what's happened to Imam al Hussein and the horse with no horse rider, some of them slapped their cheeks 
And within their tents, some of them let their hair out, not in front of the men, in, within their tents. Now, Shirat al-Shu'ur doesn't mean they went out running in front of the men. Rather, within their tents, it was a sign of their grief. One form of jaza for Imam al Hussein there's a hadith, Muawiyah, there's a hadith of uh, Jabir, where he asks Imam al Baqir, what is the meaning of jaza? And he mm -hmm. says, jaza is a, a you know, extreme form of grief. And one of the things he mentions is the slapping on the cheek or the slapping mm -hmm. on the chest. Because we have the hadith Muawiyah bin Wahab from Imam al Sadiq. Mm -hmm. That all forms of extreme grief are not recommended in Islam, except for Imam Hussein. But what's extreme grief? What's jaza? Mm -hmm. That, for example, some may slap their chest in honor of the chest that was trampled on by the horses. Others may slap their cheeks. Yes, this is of the definitions of jaza. Mm -hmm. So you find that there are people today when they, when you see the Shia beating their chest, it's in honor of the chest of Imam al Hussein, which the horse is trampled on after they killed him. However, with Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, if people are only going to focus on this, then they've missed the bigger picture of Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab is a lesson on how you remain attached to the Quran, on how mm -hmm. you remain attached to your salah, mm -hmm. on how you maintain your dignity. In the face of humiliation, how brave and how honorable you can be in front of the worst and most barbaric of God's creations. These are the lessons to learn. But for a person to come and say that what I learned from Zainab is to slap my cheek, this is the lowest of the law and mm -hmm. really shows that they haven't understood the essence of what Zainab means. A question here from uh, well there's no need to mention the name or where from because it's quite personal but in regards to maintaining a relationship with a family member who seems to be quite nice with uh, with other family members however he has habits such uh, we could say that relate to those of the polytheist well, not polytheists but those who are on the other side of uh, the camp of Imam Hussein for example maybe some drinking involved maybe some merrymaking maybe not serious enough or practicing enough how to mend relationships with, with someone like that, what would you suggest? In, in well, it seems very general, but if, for uh -huh. example, you're in a relationship with someone, let's say you're a wife, your husband is someone who, let's mm. say, drinks alcohol, that's seen as being prohibited in Islam. Yeah. The rea you know, you, you have to pray for their guidance, inshallah. Hopefully that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. You try and see someone of wisdom, someone he respects, who's a scholar, who could possibly sit with him, try and advise mm -hmm. him, sit with the friend circle and tell them to remind him. And we hope that, you know, the relationship is something that is built and not something that is broken. Um, it's a shame when we hear that there are people out there mm -hmm. who love Imam al Hussein, but at the same time, he doesn't mind having the odd drink as if his love for Imam al Hussein somehow means he, he can do that in Islamic law. You can't. A true lover of Imam al Hussein <coughs> will not act like Yazid yes, or have the principles of Yazid. So such reminders, inshallah, will help them. Inshallah. We pray for that, that family as well, inshallah, inshallah. that they could uh, you know, improve their, uh, their relationship. Um, final question. Sayyidah Zainab returns to Medina, but she's buried in Sham, or so they say she's buried in Sham. Mm. What's the story? Why is her grave not in Medina? Yeah, there's two opinions. As to, well, three opinions as to where she's buried. One is mm. the very weaker opinion of Medina. Then you have two strong opinions, one Cairo, the other oh, being Sham. Sham. It seems like she's given Yazid so much trouble in Medina, she starts giving sermons against Yazid. Mm -hmm. And the governor writes to him to say that she's causing trouble here. And seemingly Yazid orders that she's made to live not near the palace, because she doesn't want to see these people again, yes. but rather on the outskirts and in the area, the Ghuta area, um, where her shrine is today. Mm -hmm. Others say that, no, that there was a governor who was in Cairo, who had more love for the Ahl al-Bayt, and she decides to go and live there near her cousin until she dies in Cairo. Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you know, your intention is to go and visit Sayyidina Zainab. Wallahu a'ala. Yeah. Excellent. Dr. Amal Akshwani, thank you very thank much you, for this you. discussion. God bless, and, and we don't look forget forward, us in your prayers, inshallah. Oh, inshallah. Thank not. You. And, um, before we leave, a final note 
to the viewers, something that you would like them to take away from this discussion? Well, I think, you know, just looking at Sayyidina Zainab's sermon, just, you know, try your hardest every once in a while uh, to reflect on that sermon. Awesome. See what was the essence of Zainab. Awesome. You know, it's, it's, it's a sermon full of profound wisdom, like her mother's sermon known as the Khutbah al fadakiyah okay, okay, yes. You know, both of these sermons, like all the sermons of Al Muhammad, which you'll find in Najjal al Balagh and other works, try and reflect on them, inshallah. Hassan Sayyidina, thank you very much. Thank you. And to the brothers and sisters, thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. I hope it's been beneficial and I hope that you have learnt that Muharram is not just the 10 days and it's not just the death of Abba Abdullah, but also the atrocities and the tragedies that occurred upon Ali Muhammad, especially Imam Sajjad and also Sayyidah Zainab. Remember us in your du'as and join us again for Live in London with a new discussion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.